Well, uh, I don't know if anybody's ever seen this before. I, I would hope so because that's kind of my speeches on how it's impacted the world. And uh, this is the AK-47 assault rifle. And uh, I'm going to talk basically about how it's impacted uh, social and economic and political means throughout the world. So as you see uh, in the lower right hand corner there, that's uh, Mikhail Kalashnikov. He is the man that invented this weapon. And uh, it was first called the Optimat Kalashnikova. And basically what that means is the automatic rifle made by Kalashnikov. And it was, he first uh, uh, was tinkering with it uh, in World War II after he was wounded in the Battle of Bransk. And uh, he was sitting there in the hospital bed thinking, how can we get rid of these Germans that are in my country? So he was trying to think of a way that he could put a fu the firepower of a full-size rifle and a submachine gun and mesh it all together to make one, uh, one weapon that was kind of benefits all of it. And so in 1947, he was a little late. The war ended before he could put this into production. But uh, 1947, he came out with this weapon. And uh, since then, it's gained worldwide recognition. So as I was saying, it's half submachine gun, half full-size rifle. And uh, one thing that, uh, that came out of this was called an intermediate cartridge. And what this was is kind of a halfway cartridge with a, a full-size rifle. You get a long, large cartridge with a lot of powder and a lot of, uh, a lot of weight to it, actually. And uh, what he wanted, what Kalashnikov wanted to do was find something that was, had the power of that, but also had the, uh, the uh, lightness of the uh, submachine gun round, which is kind of a smaller, it's like a pistol round. So it's light and low recoil, it can fire at high uh, rate of fire. So this intermediate cartridge was kind of the best of both worlds, where it could have the range of the full-size rifle, but it could also fire quite quickly and actually, uh, the soldiers could carry a lot more ammo, so that was advantageous as well. So, yeah, had immense firepower. And he was actually called uh, the father of 100 million rifles because as of a few years ago, I mean, they're still making AK-47, uh, well, AK-47s and AK-74s, which are all variants of the same weapon, basically. You would recognize a silhouette, and they're all just slight variants, uh, and I'll get into that a little bit more later. But uh, it's produced over 100 million rifles, and you find them throughout the world, and I'll talk about that too. So after World War II, when he came up with this idea, uh, put into service, and uh, later on down the road in 1974, they introduced the AKM, which is the AK modernized, uh, and they call it the AK-74. So when I'm talking AK or AK-47 or AK-74, it's basically the same idea, same kind of weapon. Uh, one main difference of the AK-74 was it used a smaller bullet even than the original uh, AK-47. So they actually took that from the M16. Uh, and I'll get into that later when I compare the two weapons. So why is this weapon so much more powerful and why am I talking about it? Uh, a lot of it, I think, that has to do with the simplicity of it. And uh, basically, it's got a lot of room, and you can see that in the, uh, in the picture here. It's got a lot of room for the moving parts inside the receiver. And uh, that gives it a lot of reliability, because if you throw some sand in there or some dirt, that dirt can move with the parts, and it kind of goes with it, instead of uh, what a lot of weapons were earlier than that, all tight constrictions, and uh, they wanted you know, really small area, and any little grain of sand in there could screw up the whole mechanism. So that made it extremely rugged. And these, these guns were very inexpensive and easy to replicate and easy to manufacture quickly and with mass production, basically because uh, they could stamp out these receivers and the magazines, and they made the forearms and the stocks out of wood. So this was very cheap and very efficient. They could just run through a machine and get stamped make one gun, one gun, one gun. I mean, they would have to make the barrel separate and stuff, but you get the idea. They would make it very quickly. So um, I'm actually going to show a short clip from our wonderful YouTube, where we'd be without that, too. Um, and this just shows how, it, how the mechanism works. And here we see gases coming through the barrel. And this is the upper part of the, uh, part of the weapon. I'll show it a little better now. OK. So here's the inside of the receiver. It's kind of cut away. And you can see the trigger being pulled and the hammer being released 
to strike the firing pin. And the firing pin strikes the primer in the back and the uh, gases ignite, and, or the powder ignites, gases expand, pushing the bullet down the barrel. And here's this gas. See how it bled off? They call that bleeding off to push this, uh, to push this plunger back. And it actually is going to reciprocate slowly. I mean, it goes a lot faster than this. This gun shoots like 600 rounds per minute. So this is just slow motion. The gases are pushing the bolt back, ejecting the spent casing. And once it gets all the way to the rear, it resets the, the hammer. So it, it's reset, ready to fire another round. And then the spring will push the bolt forward and put a, take a new cartridge from the magazine, put it into place to be fired again. And the whole thing repeats. And in, you know, it's, it goes fast, uh, faster than your eye usually. Um, but that's, and I hope you saw that there was a lot of open space and just a lot of room for stuff to move around like I was talking about before. So, now we, got, we know how reliable this is and how rugged this is uh, and how useful it is. Now where do you find it? And these are just some of the hot spots because you can find this thing all over the place. But uh, you find it a lot in Southeast Asia and China. And uh, I have a picture here of Southeast Asia of more of outline of Vietnam here uh, because I'll get into that later. But uh, you find also heavily in the Middle East and Soviet bloc countries are what used to be behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, also Africa, South America, and recently, uh, I don't quite remember because I was a little young to watch the news at the time, but uh, Bank of America shootout in North Hollywood in Los Angeles. Uh, they were using AK-47s. And uh, so if we can get them here, they can pretty much get them anywhere. All right. So Vietnam was kind of the first time our troops came into heavy contact with this weapon and had an immense shock value on these guys because they're in the bush with, at that time, M14s, which are basically just your M1 Grands from World War II, except stepped up a little bit, had a detachable magazine, and that's another lecture. But uh, uh, they didn't have the M16s right away. And so they were really, really shocked at, oh, they got this automatic rifle. and. I can only shoot one, one bullet at a time. These guys can hold down the trigger and just spray 600 rounds a minute at me. So that, that demoralized our troops. And it actually had this distinctive sound, which uh, was used later by the troops uh, to identify enemy friend from foe. Because in Vietnam, you got all these uh, leaves and jungle, and it's just lush vegetation all over the place. If somebody heard an AK-47, it's a good chance that that's an enemy. So they could actually fire on them without seeing them. And that's, a lot of the reason why uh, our troops didn't carry them there, even though they probably wanted to because it's a lot more reliable than, uh, than our weapons. So when the M16 first came into uh, service in, uh, uh, in Vietnam, there were a lot of problems with it. It was gumming up, and a lot of it had to do with the powder that was being used. They were using ball powder instead of uh, stick powder. And I don't know exactly why that ball powder gummed up more, but actually the inventor, the M16, Eugene Stoner, didn't want the ball powder to be used. And he told them the, the brass that, and they used it anyway, and uh, so the rifle gummed up just like Eugene Stoner uh, thought it would. So eventually they got these kinks worked out, and now they're using better powder and it's working. But uh, at the time, the American soldiers were really demoralized because they were sitting there with their M16s, not firing, and guys over there in the bush wrapping away with their AK-47s. And there's actually some sad stories of guys being found by their buddies laying there with a dismantled M16. They were cleaning it while the enemy, the Viet Cong or the North Vietnamese, were, were coming at them. And their weapons were working, and his was dismantled. He was trying to clean it. So it's, it's pretty sad. And uh, that pretty much said, oh, we got to wake up. We got to fix this. Uh, one of the really, really sad parts about uh, kind of the, uh, the ideas of this gun is child soldiers. And you find these a lot, uh, this a lot happening in Africa and uh, even sometimes in the Middle East, um, South America. Uh, a lot of third world countries are doing this because children can use this weapon just as easily as adults. It's easy to clean, easy to use, and you can use it and learn it really quickly. And uh, a man by the name of Charles Taylor, a uh, Liberian uh, uh, revolutionist, used these to his advantage by giving these guns to, uh, to youth 
so that they wouldn't go and retrieve the, uh, what they call the blood diamonds. I don't know if you guys have seen the movie Blood Diamond, but they used AK-47s to get them, and Charles Taylor would use this as a payment, the AK-47 as a payment, in order for them to uh, give uh, Charles their support and be able to use them as, basically use them as, uh, as uh, soldiers. So that's kind of, that's really sad. And this created kind of, like, like I say there, the, it's a death machine. And uh, another thing that's kind of a downfall of this gun is how economical it is. It's how easy to get. Uh, they actually, I, I read in one of my sources, and I'll point out at the end, that an AK-47 could be obtained in places like Afghanistan for the cost of a chicken, like about $10, basically, uh, for our money. And that's kind of ridiculous, right? But that's, that's the way it was. So it was cheap and a lot of firepower, and it really gave a lot of uh, third world countries, you know, a lot of problems with this weapon. And uh, one, another example of how this weapon is so uh, inexpensive and easy to get was uh, in the movie Lord of War with Nicolas Cage. I forget when it was released, not too long ago. They had a lot of these AK-47s, and you can see them as props. Well, they were actual AK-47s that they bought, and uh, they were cheaper than the replicas, than the ones that they couldn't use. So what does that say? I mean, these guns are really easy to get. And after they filmed the movie, they put them back on the market and sold them. I mean, probably not to you know, revolutionists, but I, don't, I didn't find out where they sold them to, but they got rid of them on the market real easy. So now I'm gonna compare the AK-47 and the M16 just because these two weapons have been very influential in, uh, in our military history, and it seems like they've been going head to head a lot lately. So as you can see going down the list, uh, I got a lot of different, uh, different specifications on which one wins out of this. But as you see in the end, overall, it's kind of like a tie. It's, if you can afford an M16, it's more accurate and it's, it's uh, got a little bit more range, but I mean, just as good as the uh, AK because the AK has its own strengths, as you can see. So uh, a lot of these uh, third world countries are going with the AK because it's a lot more inexpensive and easier to maintain. And, uh, there's some stories of guys in Iraq right now. They are finding these M16s kind of rusted up and beat up real bad, and they can just kick the, kick the action open and f load it and fire it. I mean, that gun, who, who knows how long that gun's been sitting there. I mean, while they're M16s, I mean, they're reliable, but not, not quite up to par with the AK, even after a lot of the modernization of the M16. And as I was saying before, it was mass produced, and not only by the Soviets. Uh, different copies went to places like China, Korea, Romania, and all those Soviet bloc countries, uh, and even places in Africa are making them. Uh, they're just so easy. And actually, you could take some uh, AK-47s, like one from uh, early Soviet built, and you can take a Romanian one or a Chinese one, and you can actually interchange some of those parts. And that's I mean, that's really handy, especially to have on the battlefield, you know? So the next thing I want to talk about is fire superiority is what they call it. And uh, this is basically what uh, American soldiers have called uh, upon to use in, to their advantage. Who can get the most bullets downfield in the least amount of time? Because if you can do that, you can keep your enemy's head down and you can maneuver on them. So whoever can maneuver the most generally has the advantage. Well, this weapon gave a lot of a lot of uh, revolutionaries and anybody, pretty much anybody who was using it, gave them a really big advantage because they could, I mean, they were uh, spending much less on these weapons than we were on our M16s. Well, they can keep our heads down just as well as we can keep theirs down. So that gave them fire superiority at times and we had to work pretty hard to uh, hold up our fire superiority. So I basically like a great equalizer. And I already talked about those. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about how it's impacted us in the historical perspective. Now, when everybody thinks of weapon of mass destruction, you think of bio biological warfare, chemi chemical warfare, and nuclear warfare. Well, when you think about how many people were killed in Japan uh, from the nuclear bombs, it was 
just over 100,000, I believe. I think it was 109,000, according to one of my sources. And uh, every year, 250,000 people are killed by this weapon. And so which one is the real weapon of mass destruction? And we see this as recently as a couple weeks ago in the news, pirates in Somalia. They're going out and they're attacking ships and using this weapon. It's very cheap for, or very inexpensive for them to get and easy for them to maintain. So why not use it? That's, that's what they're doing. And uh, it, this weapon also gave rise to what was called the Kalashnikov culture. And uh, basically, revolutionaries and communists use this as a symbol of their power. And you can see that, in this case, the flag of Mozambique actually has an AK-47 on it. And uh, the flag of Hezbollah, I believe, has it. And uh, I'm not sure, but I, I, I'm thinking there are several other uh, several other organizations around the world, terrorist organizations, that are using this basically as a symbol. And you can see that, like in Osama bin Laden, when he was on his, uh, on his uh, uh, interviews, he always had his AK right next to him. Everybody could see that. They always made sure that it was prominent. And they're, you know, they're using this as a, as a sort of symbol of power. And, and it, it's very effective. So to close, I just want to say, with respect to power and reliability, when people are thinking, OK, what are we going to use in the modern war? Well, an obvious choice is the AK-47. You can't go wrong with it. It's reliable. It's inexpensive. And it's really easy to obtain. And everybody can use it. It's very simple. So for better or for worse, this is one of the most influential pieces of hardware mankind has ever devised. And uh, I don't think, I don't think uh, I'm going to argue with it if I see one coming into my room. So, and before I get to questions, I just want to show you guys kind of a, a clip of how powerful this weapon really is. And, and by no means am I advocating, or advocating this because this, is, this guy is not very smart. I, I, could, I could point out five or six different reasons why he's not. That's an AK. And notice he's not wearing uh, eye protection or uh, he might be wearing ear protection, but I'm not going to get into that. And you can see it's on fire already. Still firing, just fine, and actually not that bad. It's pretty accurate. You can see him spraying all over the forest there. Uh, he's not done. This one takes a little bit, but he's not done. <laughs> oh, he'll get it. <laughs> Starting campfire. Yeah. One of another many uses. Still on fire. Still grabbing more ammo. I hope they went down there and checked to see if anybody was down there. Yeah, too hot. That's what he said. Yeah. I'm not advocating that, but I thought that clip was a really good demonstration on what that gun could actually do. And he's probably still using it. I don't know. He hasn't had any new ones lately, but he's probably still using it. So uh, whoop, those are my sources. Let me go back. In case you guys have any questions about my sources, uh, the one source, the Larry K. Hunter and uh, the weapon that changed the face of war, I actually bought the book because I liked it so much. So I got a lot of my information from there. And uh, anybody have any questions? Oh, sorry. Very much a presentation on the history of technology. Yes. Yes. Isn't the, uh, the ammunition for that more expensive for a 7.62 mm? The, the 7.62 7 by 39 for the original AK is really cheap. You can get it in bulk very cheap. And um, you, can, you can go to any sporting goods store and find it. And you compare it to the M16, which has the 223 round, the Remington 223. Uh, NATO has a different word for it, but I don't remember that. But the, the Remington 223 is a smaller, but it is slightly more expensive than the, than the AK's uh, 7.62 by 39. The AK-74, however, that has the smaller bullet. And uh, what they found with those smaller bullets is they actually created more of a wound channel. The smaller bullet would hit the, hit the object, most likely uh, for this uh, case in war, they're hit, hitting humans. And they're going through, and the bullet is actually tumbling. And it's causing a larger wound channel than the, the larger bullet that would, that would just expand. And this, this tumbling, and it would actually fracture sometime, it put a guy down just as good as a larger bullet. So, uh, but 
as far as expense goes, I'm not sure exactly how expensive the new AK-74 rounds are, but uh, I, would, I would expect they're no more expensive than the 223 rounds. But uh, the, the original 7.62 by 39, you can get those dime a dozen pretty cheap. So, Any other questions? Two different kinds of magazines around. And yeah, and you can you can buy several different ones. The that one was a dual drum magazine. That's ridiculous. I don't know. If, I mean, for hunting, it's extremely ridiculous mm -hmm. because you're never going to fire that many times when you're hunting. So this definitely was just uh, uh, the guy was out. I hate to call it playing, but you know he was just screwing around with it, which is why I don't advocate that kind of activity with that weapon. But uh, yeah, and then you could have a 30 round clip mag drum or banana magazine, I'm sorry. And uh, what that curve actually, I don't know if I have much more time, but that curve, I can go on for days about this, but that curve is actually because as the bullets fit in there, the tip of the bullet, it, it's concaved in so that if they could squish the tips together and make it that banana shape, they could fit more ammo in there. So that's why you see that banana shaped clip. And um, what was it? Burning up. What was it? I mean, obviously heat, but is that right. a defect? Uh, no, uh, the barrel was just that hot, and since the forearm and the and the stock were made of wood, they mu must have reached that. Same true with the M16. Uh, no, the M16 is made of uh, uh, I forget what it's called, but it's a sort of uh, uh, so it's kind of like plastic. It's not plastic, but it's it's a some sort of carbonate. I forget what it was, um, but it's it's just like a molded plastic. That would seem to be a pretty important advantage in the field. Yeah, you know, well, kind of a lot of guys aren't shooting that many times, so. Yeah. But, uh, you know, not that fast anyway. They'll shoot that many rounds, but maybe not quite that fast in succession. So. Other comments or questions? Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, uh, well, I was just going to ask, um, are there any reasons other than, you know, the, the sort of technological and industrial reasons why the AK-47 is so cheap and so, uh, you know, so Yes, available. yes, and that's in my paper, actually. Um, when communism fell in the Soviet Union, the, uh, the Soviet bloc countries, everything behind this, the uh, curtain, they were relying on the Soviet Union to uh, give them, you know, monetary aid and help them support their own economy. Well, as soon as that fell, they had nothing but these AKs and a lot of AK-producing uh, manufacturing facilities. So they had those, but they didn't have money. So what do they do? Sell them all over the world. That's why, that's a lot, another reason why they spread so much. And, and uh, that's in my paper too, but I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, you mentioned from the beginning, I have two questions for you. The one where you mentioned at the beginning, this uh, spread all over. Mm -hmm. But if there's a center point, place where they have the mass production, or is like anyone can where, where um, do you buy them? Where do you provide well, factories? You can get them you can get them basically anywhere. I mean you can go to a sporting goods store around here, but they're not the fully automatic ones that you see. They're they're semi automatic and they're not called AK forty sevens, but they're they're the same general idea and the same concept. But uh, the manufacturing basically took place in uh, in the Soviet Union and now like I said they they have been replicated in other countries, China, Korea, and Iran. Uh, I know you can find Romanian ones yet, uh, but there, and there's a company called Is Ishmash in the United States too that's producing them too, but they're, like I said, they're, they're the sporterized ones where they're semi-automatic, so. My, uh, my question, and the second question is, why do you resell them? Why do you research? Why did I research this? Mm -hmm. I really, really like military history. I'm a big history geek, and uh, everybody in my hometown of Kiel knows it. And uh, so when I looked at what, what I could do my research project for, for History 300, I wanted to do something on military history, but something that, that I hadn't looked into yet. I had done a lot of World War II and uh, Civil War stuff, and I was trying to think, okay, what has had a big impact on the way war is fought? And I was going through my head, you know, yeah, you can say tanks or aircraft, but that's so broad. Why not pick one, one item? And uh, actually, I had watched the movie Lord of War like just before you assigned it to us. And so I, I remember that, and I'm like, wow, that really does have a big impact on 
on the world, so that's why I researched this topic. Was this a completely original design, or did he model his design? There's some uh, discretion on that. Um, Kalashnikov says that it was original, that he made it originally. And now, when, when you think of the word assault rifle, if you, if you take the German translation, it's Sturmgewehr. You know, and what the Germans had in 1944 was uh, the MG44. And that was basically, uh, an inter it used an intermediate cartridge, uh, select fire, fully automatic or semi-automatic rifle that looked kind of like the AK-47. So a lot of people think maybe he got the idea from that, but Kalashnikov insists he did not. So I couldn't tell you. You'd have to ask Mikhail Kalashnikov. <laughs> Why would the flags and why would Osama have an AK-47 here rather than AK-74? Um, well, actually, Osama didn't have an actual AK-47. It was just a different variant. It was kind of like the submachine gun version, uh, like the AK-79U or something. I don't remember exactly what it was called, but um, but they they used different variants, and the AK-74 was just or the AK-47 was just what kind of started the whole. Uh, uh, all these variants getting used because it was so reliable and so, so a, influential. A, a 79 too? Yeah, 79U, I believe is what it's called, and that it's like a, it's a, like an AK, but it's a, like a, almost like a submachine gun. I use an even smaller round. So there's still versions. Being there's made. yeah, there's sniper versions. There's fully uh, large machine gun versions. There's uh, uh, like I said, the submachine gun versions, and there's even a shotgun that Ishmash uses, and it's. <laughs> That's devastating too. So they're all just variants of the same design that Kalashnikov originated with. Well, let us thank David very much. Uh, thanks for listening.